Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you today to the Vital Connections webinar, Building Relationships on Your Journey with Childhood Rheumatic Disease. I'm Marissa Sangers. I'm the Youth and Family Engagement Coordinator here. Um, I'm also a juvenile arthritis mom to my 11-year-old named Charlotte, who has enthesitis-related arthritis and uveitis. Um, I've been a volunteer with Cassie and Friends for several years, and now this my career is connecting everyone, which is amazing. Um, I'm going to start off everything today with helping, um, with thanking our educational sponsor. If you can't tell, I'm a little nervous because I've never hosted one of these before. Um, Nicola Wealth Management has been helping us run so many of our amazing webinars that you can find in our virtual education library. Um, many of you have known that through the Facebook page, our Juvenile Arthritis Canada page, I consistently am sharing resources off of the virtual education library and our classroom hub. And I encourage everybody to check those out. There's so many different resources here, whether you're newly diagnosed, if you want to share those resources with anybody else um, to really teach anyone, school, family, everything else. Um, they're great resources that have really helped my family over the years. And it's so exciting that we're able to add tonight to those resources. It's not changing slides. We have 23 different cities in Canada representing us. And I see so many of you joining into the chat, introducing yourself from Saskatoon and Ontario, um, a few of you in Toronto. So not very far from me. And that is really exciting to see our community all over Canada. Um, we have put a couple polls in so we can really get to know each other when we're talking about our community. And our first poll is how far along is your family on your childhood rheumatic disease journey? Um, the poll should just pop up here and you should be able to do those. Hi, Marissa, it's Brittany here. We're just having Perfect. a problem with the polls. Um, if Jessica is on the call, we just need Jessica to go into the more button and then add poll and then click on the polls slash quizzes and then launch poll number one. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Jessica. No problem. Just one second here. Polls and quizzes and launch poll one. Here we go. Yeah. Thank you. Is that coming up for people? Perfect. And then we'll maybe give everybody five more seconds. And then Jessica, if you want to um, share the results of the poll, that would be awesome. Okay, I'll give it another minute here. Oh no, you can you can do it in like oh. two seconds. <laughs> Perfect. Then uh, here we go. Share results. Marissa, are you able to see that? I'm not able to see the results. I'm assuming because you can all see my screen instead. So. Okay. Let's just see. Sorry, everybody. This is. Four years into Zoom, and we're still learning about all the different tech hiccups. It uh, did come up for me. I can see the results. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, can you let us know what do the results say? We're making <laughs> a very interactive <laughs> webinar <There you>. today. <laughs> exactly. What a way to start. So 35% newly diagnosed, less than a year in. 18% or one to two years. 
six percent three to five years and five years plus is 41 percent wow yeah I know a while ago I had put a poll on our juvenile arthritis Canada Facebook page and it was very similar results it's I myself we are over five years in and yeah it's really nice to see the people who keep coming back so thank you for joining us no matter where you are in your journey um poll number two which aspects or challenges do you feel you could use a bit more support with here we go should be live And I think it goes to show that no matter where you are on your journey, you can always use support. You're always dealing with something new, something changing, growing children, new adventures, and Cassie and Friends is always here to support along the way. Yeah, that's a great point, Brittany. Thank you. Okay, I think go ahead and share the results, Jessica. And then, Nicola, if we can volunteer you again to <laughs> share the results. Thank you so much for being no our problem. <laughs> Watch now, it won't show up for me. It'll be someone else <laughs> this time. <laughs> uh, oh, I got us. Okay, so 44% injection support. 22% medication side effects, 6% school support, 61% educating others about juvenile arthritis, 61% mental health impacts, 17% feeling overwhelmed with where to start, 33% finding a community of support, 22% uh, supporting my child, teen or youth to be more independent, and 6% uh, other. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, that like, I feel that in my heart for every single one of those different things. I'm very passionate about all the different work that Cassie and Friends has been doing, especially with the mental health. That was one of my first big projects that I helped when we did a hackathon a few years back um, to really help bring that in. And we got some amazing research going on in some of those different fields. So I'm really excited to hear that that is where everybody is here. We're wanting so much in our community. Um, we are going to be having a Q&A where many of those different questions can be introduced. And we have two wonderful healthcare providers that have joined us later on today. Um, but first off, we have Brittany Dyroff coming to help introduce her story of being a parent and sharing the information. Um, Brittany's journey into the world of juvenile arthritis really began with her daughter, Aubrey, who is, or Audrey, who is the cutest thing in the entire world. And I actually got an email from Brittany immediately when she got diagnosed and we connected and She's going to share her story today about having to figure out the all of it, navigating everything with the medical field when she actually works in the medical field and learning something completely new that she's not sure about. So if Brittany, you wanna unmute, I'll stop sharing and you can go to your slides, that would be amazing. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction, Marissa. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my slides here. So just everyone bear with me for a minute, please. Okay, let's see if this will work. Can everybody see my slides okay? Yeah, You're wonderful. Okay. okay, well, thank you again for the introduction. My name is Brittany. I am a parent ambassador 
for Cassie and Friends here in Edmonton. And um, I decided to include some slides just because I thought some photos might be nice uh, for you to kind of see some of the things we've gone through. This is my daughter, Audrey. She is four and a half years old. Um, and this was her at our most recent run in September. So our journey, um, Audrey was diagnosed at just, just about 18 months or so. Um, it came really shortly after we first started noticing her limp on and off. Um, it was more pronounced in the morning, like most kids, unfortunately. Um, and over a couple of weeks, we actually realized her right ankle was quite swollen. Um, from there, it actually progressed over six weeks um, to Audrey not being able to walk in the mornings. Um, she was complaining of pain when I was, you know, for instance, putting her in and out of her sleepers or her pajamas. And um, by that point, she had two swollen knees and a swollen right ankle. And I decided to share with everyone on the screen here my notes. You can see they're just notes from my phone. Um, I took notes. I took videos. I think it was just instinctively. I very, very little about it, other than the fact that it existed. And um, my husband, he's in healthcare as well. He's a respiratory therapist. And we both thought, mm, I don't, like, I don't think it, we don't know. I don't think so. And then as soon as she went from having her right ankle being affected to her left knee being affected, we knew something was up and, and maybe it could be. Um, at the time, we were very scared, very anxious. We knew something was wrong. Um, I am grateful that I documented a lot. I think it really helped when we saw our pediatrician for the first time. You know, she was able to do her assessment and look at the videos and the documentation and the timelines. And um, she did agree that she thought it was potentially juvenile arthritis. And I remember I was 20 weeks pregnant with my son at the time, and I was just so relieved. I instinctively started bawling in her office. Um, we, I think, from what I have learned now, are such an anomaly. Um, we had a pediatrician who happened to be working at the, or has worked at the Stollery uh, Rheumatology Clinic. Um, so she was also familiar with the signs and symptoms of JIA. Um, we have heard so many stories since then of um, misdiagnosis or a long wait for diagnosis. And um, so we recognize how, how lucky we are in that sense. Um, shortly after her initial appointment with the the rheumatology clinic. Um, Audrey was in for steroid injections um, in both of her knees and her right ankle. Um, they cleared up her knees really quickly, which was wonderful. Um, unfortunately, her right ankle continued to be very stubborn and it has for the last three years. So since January 2021, um, Audrey's been on naproxen, she's been on methotrexate, she's been on Embrel. And she's been getting annual MRIs, which you can see in this picture here, um, on her right ankle. In the spring, and she ended up being in medicated remission, which was wonderful news. But at the same time, Is unfortunately going to require major ankle surgery. And in, I want to say April, and we didn't find out till September. And that was really frustrating for us. Um, at the time, Audrey's a very active four-year-old. Um, we noticed that she would complain about her feet being tired at times after being at the playground. 
found. Um, and eventually we recognized that it was her affected ankle that she was complaining about. Um, because she was so active, we were so unsure about this surgery. We were frustrated because it felt unexpected. Um, I remember going into this ortho appointment thinking We called our rheumatology team at the Stollery and um, over the next, I would say month or so, um, both the rheumatology team and uh, the surgical team were looking into the surgery itself and what is the best plan for Audrey? Really, what, what are we gonna decide here? Do we do this surgery on this really active four-year-old um, that doesn't complain often? Um, what if, we don't do something and it gets worse over time and it's gonna disadvantage her down the road. What is rehab gonna look like? Can she start kindergarten in the fall without a cast or a walking boot? And so we had lots of questions. We still have lots of questions. The surgeon at the time, she's incredible, but she also mentioned this is a very uncommon occurrence. It is a very rare surgery, one that she has only done once in a totally different situation, more of a trauma situation with a much older patient in their teens. And so in order for us to make the right decision for our daughter, we leaned on our rheumatology team as much as we did the ortho team. And we asked lots of questions. I reached out to Cassie and friends. I asked them questions. Um, through connecting and being part of Cassie and Friends, I have managed to meet a lot of people in the community. So I started asking them questions too. Um, both people that work in healthcare and parents as well. So as you can see on the screen, we did end up going through with the surgery. Um, you can see Audrey had two different casts at two different points. She recently got the cast off just over a week ago. Uh, she had four pins placed into her joint and um, it was not easy. It still is not easy to keep a four and a half year old to, uh, you know, relax and stay still. Um, we were very lucky that the surgery went very well and she's still in the early, early stages of recovery. Um, but we also learned through our questions and investigation that had we not gone through with this down the road, she would be much worse off. And it was also an opportune time because she was in medicated remission. So a little bit about how I got involved with Cassie and Friends. Um, I initially, on our first uh, appointment, I asked our rheumatologist, you know, is there, are there any groups, are there any, you know, people that I can talk to about this? And he uh, recommended Cassie and Friends. And it was, um, you know, January 2021 at the time. So uh, we were social distancing, of course, a lot. There wasn't much going on where you could collaborate with people. And so Cassie and friends were putting on webinars just like this month. And my husband and I figured we have lots. So it was a really good really place nice to start. Um, it was an you know, an organization that I knew I could trust and would have um, both evidence-based medicine on top of resources coming from actual families that we could relate to. And one of the first webinars, I actually have some screenshots up here from Dr. Guzman's um, webinar, his talk on methotrexate. Um, he's one of the rheumatologists from DC Children's Hospital. And um, we were able to watch this it was very timely for us as Audrey was probably a couple weeks of know where to go. And so this webinar really sticks out to my husband and I because it really put our minds at ease with going on the medication. It also helped us make the decision to actually start with injections and not do oral with her at all. And that's a decision I'm still very happy that we made.
I also got involved with the runs for Cassie and Friends, so their annual walk runs to raise awareness and, of course, fundraise uh, for Cassie and Friends. So for research, for webinars, for education, for, um, you know, injection support, so many different aspects of care for kids with juvenile arthritis and rheumatic diseases. And this was our very first Cassie and Friends run that um, we had, and it was honestly just our little village, our group of people and supporters, and we did it at our little community park uh, where we were living at the time. And uh, we had everyone kind of come out. We had t-shirts for people and we just did the walk together. And, and as a family, we raised over $4,000 that year, which was really cool. for this and it was really cool because it allowed us to connect with people unexpectedly um it, it also allowed us to learn from other people as well um people that are part of our JI community that we didn't know for example one of my co-workers I would have never been able to connect with her the way we've made a connection now through our daughters fortunately unfortunately this is 2022, um, so this was an Edmonton run, um, and you can see Britt came up um, from Cassie and Friends, so it was wonderful to get to, to meet her finally. Um, that year we raised over 11 girl we're talking about where their alleys were and and those are the connections that have become so important to us and and why I continue to volunteer for casting friends. Lastly, this was the most recent run. Uh, this was the run that we recently did in September 2023. Uh, we raised over $33,000 this past year, um, which was really exciting. We got to connect with many families in the region and, and um, that's honestly the, the most special part about it. So lastly, I know I have a couple minutes left here, so I apologize, um, but I wanted to just kind of share some tips and advice that I've learned from our journey so far. Um, I think the biggest one is just advocate. You know something is wrong. It's not just growing pains. You know something is off. Um, don't hesitate to call the clinics. Um, I have left numerous messages for the nurses at the Solary Clinic here. Um, so in the last three years, it's it's I've been very fortunate to to have such close proximity to healthcare, great healthcare, and um, they're always available for us. I would also say advocate and document too. I think that really helps, and not just necessarily what you're seeing, but even what you're hearing in your appointments. Um, so. I would write down questions on my phone and I know I'm gonna have my phone with me at the appointment and I shouldn't lose it. Um, and so I'd be able to ask these questions to our rheumatologists. And then I would also take notes as well. Um, maybe my husband's not with me that day and I need to relay the information to him. Um, I also always try to say in summary or just to clarify, um, I work in healthcare, but I have lots of questions too. And so don't hesitate to ask them. There's no silly questions. Uh, share your story would be my other little tip. Um, once again, people are gonna learn from you. You're gonna be able to educate others, but also you're gonna learn from them and potentially build connection in unexpected places. Utilize the resources. So Cassie Friends has been such an amazing resource for us, not just from the webinars, but also, um, connecting us with other families um, or newly diagnosed families where we're able to answer questions or bounce ideas off of. And one in which we actually um, got to know uh, fairly well and they became you know, part of the, the volunteer team for our run, which was amazing. Uh, I think Cassie and Friends is also a go-to when you're not sure what you need. And I think that's really important because I think a lot of the times as parents, we know we need something, we just don't know what it is. And so they can really connect you that way. Lastly, um, it's 
an invisible disease sometimes, um, but you're not alone. And I think that's one thing that I've learned from this over the last three years and building the connections. And Marissa, once again, was one of the first people to reach out to me. And it was so nice to hear another parent and to hear that, you know, they're going through similar things, albeit our daughters are different ages, but she understood what I was asking and my concerns and, and all those different things. So um, yeah, those would be my four pieces of advice. And I, um, it's, it can suck for sure at times, but there is a community out there and you're not alone. Brittany, thanks so much for sharing. Oh, I like, I know I've already heard everything, but it's so, it's so true. I have the exact same, and I saw somebody else put in the chat too. I have the exact same notes file on my phone for doctor's appointments. It's a Google doc that just is an ongoing thing of you, right? Uh, limping again or something like yeah. that. Like it's just completely so true. Um, I did know, so there was some audio cutting in and out. So are you able to share why Audrey had to go and get her surgery? Oh, yeah, I was, you know, I was worried it was cutting out. I noticed it was kind of freezing at times. So I apologize. Um, so she ended up getting her surgery because her talus bone was essentially like supplicated. It was so far forward that it was eroding her her leg bone. And so if it continued, it would stay out of joint. Um, and down the road, she would need an ankle fusion, which would have been far more limiting to her mobility, um, rather than us trying now to put it back into place. Uh, she has age on her side at being four and a half. Um, and so that is, is why we did it. They don't even know if it is 100% connected to the JIA that was in her joint or not. Um, but it's such a rare phenomenon. And um, so we elected to do something about it, hopefully for the best. We're still learning lots. We're in the early stages. Yeah. Oh, fingers crossed. I hope it all goes well. And I know you said she was able to finally get her other cast off. So I'm sure she was quite excited about that. Yes. <laughs> um, well, from Brittany to now our wonderful certified family life educator and parent coach, Lisa Green. Um, Lisa is a certified life educator, a parent coach and a mom. She had two children, both living with chronic illness, and she knows the challenges that parents are facing. So Lisa, take us away on this wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my, my slides okay? Does everything look good? Okay, That's great. Brittany. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Welcome. What what an amazing job, Brittany. Thank you. And what a tough act to follow, but um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I like to say um, that uh, I don't have an MD or a PhD, but I do have MOM after my name. And that has been my most important job, taking care of my two children um, through the years. And there's a lot to take care of because they both have cystic fibrosis. CF is a genetic disease that causes the mucus in the lungs to become thick and sticky. And this sticky mucus traps bad bacteria in the lungs, which then causes lung infections. So in order to try to prevent this, my kids take about, oh, about 18 different prescriptions each day between them, including three or four that are inhaled. Plus they do chest physical therapy twice a day with a machine called the vest. Um, and all of this can take about two hours a day, like about an hour in the morning and an hour at night. Plus we have hospitalizations for IV antibiotics, um, you know, for a couple, two or three weeks at a time. Sometimes we do them from home and lots of doctor's appointments and labs and on and on and on. Um, I'm so grateful for good medical care. And I have a lot of hope that my kids who are now young adults will outlive me. Um, they're now ages 25 and 23 and they're doing well. So obviously they're doing the bulk of this work themselves. And there are new medications that are cutting down on a lot of these required treatments, but they still get sick and you know the machine ramps up and we have to go th through this. Um, they're doing well, but their outcome depends on many factors, including how well they take care of themselves. 
And an important part of their self-care and their self-management will come from partnership that I and now they create with our medical providers. And we have a big medical team behind us. We have pulmonologists, we have dietitians, we have endocrinologists, we have gastroenterologists, we have ENTs, we have pharmacists, we have respiratory therapists, we have nurse practitioners, we have social workers, and we have psychologists. So we have a really big team. And this picture that you see is what they see, all these different people, this is what they see of our life each practitioner only seeing a tiny slice of what they specialize in. Um, before I go on to the next slide, I wanna check to make sure I'm not cutting out and that the sound is good and that I'm okay. If I do start to cut out, if someone could tell me somehow, um, I will turn my video off. I know it's not as dynamic, but at least I think that will help with that issue with bandwidth, but I, I think we should be okay. All right, so um, so this is what each practitioner, little practitioner sees, but we have so much more um, to our our lives. And uh, let's see, there we go. We have so much more to our lives. We have rich, full lives that are now filled with work, with college. My son is in medical school. Um, through the years, my kids have been involved in sports, um, leisure activities, different kinds of organizations. Of course, they have friends um, and family time, vacation time, plus, of course, all the things that my husband and I would do to make a living and keep a home running. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a lot going on. And then we also have, so these are the things that, you know, people see about our lives, right? Whether they're friends or family, medical professionals. But then we have all of the invisible tasks that are going on beneath the, the surface as we do our best to live well with um, a complex medical diagnosis. In 2019, I participated in a qualitative analysis project with CF colleagues through the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Nursing. We analyzed 160 surveys about living with CF completed by 80 parents of children with CF and 80 adults with CF. The analysis generated themes, one of which show the developmental processes of parenting children with cystic fibrosis. And I believe that this can be generalized to other pediatric illness op, um, populations. And I think you guys will see a lot of commonalities here with what you deal with. So we chose to use trees as metaphors to illustrate this. Um, we use trees to illustrate the growth, the strength, the adaptability, and the resilience of parents of children with CF and the adults with CF that were found in the data. This metaphor also illustrates their experiences as visible and invisible to care providers. So over time, trees develop deep underground root systems, which are unseen by us, that provide them with the essential nutrients needed to grow strong trunks and branches critical to blossom and to withstand adverse weather conditions. Similarly, Similarly, um, parents and persons with CF develop adaptive strategies to weather the many complex challenges of life with CF. So what may be less visible to care teams are represented as the roots of the tree. And these are all of the social processes, the management activities, the emotions and the concerns that are always present at home, but not often disclosed or fully disclosed to care teams. And so as you look at this slide, you can see, you know, the above the ground and below the ground, all of the things that are going on in our lives. And like a tree, you and your child will grow and you will become stronger. And so too will your knowledge, your skills and your resilience. And because so many of these areas are invisible to our healthcare teams, we need to educate them about what's going on beneath the surface. And we need to advocate for our children and for also ourselves as their parents and let them know what our needs are and where our struggles are. 
So you may be asking, why do relationships with our medical providers matter? Now, for some people with simple health care needs, it might not. I mean, I personally don't need a relationship with my own medical provider because at least right now, I don't have a complicated medical condition. My annual exam does me well, and I might pop into the clinic if I have, you know, the flu or something going on. But when people have a complex uh, medical condition like rheumatoid arthritis, a bleeding disorder, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, relationships do matter. And here's why. I'm not sure where the red mark came from, but anyway, it looks like it's going to carry over on all my slides. Sorry about that. Looks like someone was making a note. All right. So there are associations between adherence or non-adherence and provider relationships and communication. Other areas that are affected include health knowledge, self-efficacy, and patient satisfaction. Good provider, patient provider relationships can be a family protective factor and an aspect of resiliency. And having mutual respect and communication early in the disease can affect parental coping and competence throughout the life cycle of the disease. So without reading all of this, these are the citations coming from many different studies. Clearly, it's critical for people with a complex medical condition to have a good relationship with care providers. In the CF community, we call this partnership in care. So partnership in care. As you work with you or your loved one's care team, you may hear the phrases family-centered care, patient-centered care, culturally respectful care. You might be wondering what these mean. And it's important to know what this means because this can help you understand what to expect from your care team. There's been a trend in healthcare to understand the perspectives of the person with the health condition and involve their family members in care and decision-making. Patient-centered care, focuses on the whole person, not just the health problem, and seeks to understand the patient's illness experience. This also includes a mental health aspect of care. Now, family-centered care recognizes the important role of parents, respects family preferences, collaborates with parents in decisions, and supports family strengths. It also involves creating hospitals and clinic policies that are family-friendly, one example might be having playrooms um, for siblings or um, having policies which allow parents and siblings to stay overnight with um, inpatient, um, you know, inpatient stays. Culturally respective care, culturally respectful care is tailored in response to patient and family cultural values. Um, in America, we're a melting pot. In Canada, you also have many different cultures and cultural values. Health information is also adapted to meet linguistic and liter literacy needs for different families. So according to the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, and this, of course, is in the USA, but I, I, I understand it's similar for Canada, patient and family-centered care is an approach to the planning, delivery, and evolution of health care that is grounded in mutually beneficial partnerships among health care providers, patients and families. And this is really important because it replaces that old authoritarian top-down system where the doctor knows it all. It redefines the relationships in healthcare by placing an emphasis, an emphasis on collaborating with people of all ages, at all levels of care, and in all healthcare settings. In patient and family-centered care, Patients and families define their family. We get to decide who our family is and determine how we will participate in our care and our decision making. But as you may know, the shift takes time and it isn't completely there yet. So we need to be actively involved in the process of communicating, advocating, and building partnership with our care teams. So it really all boils down to trust. Trust is essential to the patient-provider relationship. Patients with high trust in their healthcare providers have been found to have improved outcomes, including improved chronic disease management, increased use of preventative services, and satisfaction with care. And breaches of trust in the healthcare system threaten trust. Trust is foundational for good care. There's a lot of literature out there about how doctors can gain the trust, can gain the trust of their patients. 
Here's some quotes from another project I was involved in that looked at explicit mentions of trust in a patient family experience of care survey for CF families across the United States. These are quotes from pa parents and patients that express the things that their doctors do that build trust with them. They respect your complete <laughs> participation and ideas about improving your health care plan. They ask questions. From the time you arrive at the center, you're greeted on a first name basis and greeted with, warm em with warmth and empathy for your needs for that day. Most of them are genuinely interested and willing to work with our family to develop the best care plan possible. And they always take my child's feelings into consideration before doing anything, knowing her anxiety of it all. So these are things that you as patients probably already know, right? Oh, here's another one. They care about what we think and take and they take the time to listen to us. So right now you are being validated right now in what you might have felt, but maybe you needed to hear this out loud. These are all things that we need from our doctors in order to trust them. But what's not as clear from the literature is what do they need from us? Trust is a two-way relationship from our end, which we're going to learn about in the coming slides. Healthcare agencies that practice patient and family-centered care, culturally respectful care, and partnership are more likely to involve patients and parents in two-way conversations along with decision-making. Now, some decisions can be relatively easy, like looking at a family's lifestyle and making small modifications. However, there can be times when medical recommendations or, or best practices um, are at odds with a particular family situation due to cost, time, lifestyle, or beliefs. A family-centered philosophy of care becomes particularly important under such circumstances because it encourages patients and parents to, spe to speak up and share their opinions. Knowing what you need as a family and how to present your unique point of view will help you to be better understood by your care team members, as well as to create a climate of trust, collaboration, and partnership. My own trust has evolved for my family. Um, for my fam my own trust has evolved for my family over the years through effective communication and partnership skills. Our experience with the medical system was not always really positive. When my son Jacob was born, a surgeon with very poor bedside manners was very harsh in his approach to telling us that our firstborn most likely had cystic fibrosis. My husband and I were absolutely devastated. We experienced what has been described as defensive communication. This news came at a very vulnerable time in our lives when we were not, we were not, we were new to parenting and we were not comfortable. We didn't know anything about CF. And that negative experience led us to doubt, if not outright distrust, our healthcare providers. Now, thankfully, there were medical professionals, particularly the NICU nurses, the neonatal intensive care nurses, and our CF team, who we eventually connected with, who helped repair the hurt and restore our trust in our providers. They helped us find hope for the future. They provided us with all of the information we needed, and they were there to help us cope with the emotions that were so overwhelming. And this is referred to as supportive communication in the literature. So as I mentioned, building relationships is a two-way process. Both parties need to make it work, and it hasn't always been easy. Some of the um, sometimes we have differences of opinion with our healthcare providers. C certain issues aren't black and white. However, we're able to listen to each other's perspectives and develop a mutually agreed to plan. And I also appreciate that when our CF team and other caregivers have been forgiving of me or my husband, we weren't when we weren't at our best. Obviously, you know, there can be very stressful emotional times. And when we when we weren't at our best, we need to take responsibility for our miscommunications and our bad attitudes, just with, as we expect our healthcare providers to do for us. Um, when my daughter was hospitalized, I became very emotional about an unexpected problem, and I scolded a nurse. And after I calmed down, I sought her out and I apologized. She graciously accepted my apology, and she took responsibility for the, the things that she was doing that caused me to be so concerned. We talked about my concerns, and we walked, worked together to solve the problem. 
And I'm, I will never forget her patience and kindness. And I will also never forget how easy it can be for me to react with strong emotions during times of stress. It's very normal, um, but we need to repair that relationship both for the provider's sake and for my own. I didn't feel good about how I'd handle it, even though it was kind of an error on her side with um, some needle pokes with my daughter when she was needing to get an IV. And so that's why good self-care and communication skills are so important. We are human. We're all human. We all make mistakes. However, we also can repair those damaged relationships. And now that my kids are young adults and they're managing their care independently, they're developing their own relationships and their own communication styles with their team. We all see our CF team as an extension of our family, and they've been an important part of helping my husband and me raise our two kids with CF to be hopeful, to take care, good care of themselves, and to speak up for themselves. My kids have learned how to speak up for themselves, how to advocate, and how to build a relationship by watching how my husband and I have done this over the years. And it, have, it hasn't been easy, but it's been worth the work. And again, I want to remind you, because this is about relationship, as human beings, we will work harder, do more, and go the extra mile for people we like, people who we are bonded to, and who we have a good relationship with. And this applies to parents, to teachers, to managers, and yes, this applies to doctors and all of our medical professionals. So relationship matters, and people skills matter in relationships. The old saying is true, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar, and the world of medicine is based on people. So there's an art to being an effective advocate. It takes a bit of finesse. You want to come through as authoritative, but not demanding. You want to be friendly and cooperative, but you don't want to be a pushover. You want to be a team player. And it can be a fine line at times. But remember, behind every decision is a person. Communication is the glue that holds families, teams, and people together. Now, many people think that communication is about talking. It's not. Communication is defined as the process of understanding and sharing meaning. Talking is simply a tool to help us communicate, just like writing is a tool to help us communicate. Communication is a dynamic process that involves a sender and a receiver of information in the hopes of creating shared meaning or understanding about a topic. Let's start with being a good receiver or being a good listener. So what is listening? Listening is attaching sound through knowledge and experience. Well, how is it different from hearing? Hearing is just the physical reception of sound. It's passive and it's automatic. But listening is active and intentional, and it involves three functions, hearing, processing the message, and reacting to the message through communication, which is words or body language. And so we want to think about how do you feel when you know you're not being listened to? We don't feel good. We know. We sense it. We feel discounted. We feel uninvolved. We feel offended. And some of the clues that tell us when we're not being listened to are things like failure to make eye contact, closed or, def closed or defensive body posture, doing something else like texting, reading, or no physical cues like nodding. Maybe we're, you know, we're not, we're not getting the sense that someone's really connecting with us. And of course, the way that we come through is just as important as the words that we say. And in a situation where there are high emotions, as in many, many medical encounters, language or the words are only a small percentage of communication. The West, rest of the way that words are said um, and facial expression, even on the phone, people can pick up on it. So here's an example. So close your eyes and listen to the different messages being conveyed here. What? I can't believe this. Oh, I just can't believe this. Versus this. What? Oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I just can't believe this. Same words, two very different messages. So as human beings, we may be reacting to a person's unspoken messages without even realizing it. And this can get in the way of communicating clearly. So we wanna be aware of how our body language cues come through both in ourselves and in our others. And this picture that I have is a great example of body language stances that we don't wanna use if we want open communication. 
So if you find yourself standing with your arms crossed because that's natural for you, and for some people it is, just notice it and just drop your arms and be more open and tilt your head slightly. Just tilt your head slightly for a more open position. And if you do this, if you do this, your listener will trust your words more. Isn't that interesting? Sort of an interesting little um, communication tip. So when when you're when you're working with your med medical providers, be attentive. Don't look at your cell phone. Have your ringer turned off or your do not disturb on. Use eye contact. Be attentive. Have a pleasant demeanor or countenance. Practice it in the mirror if you need to. Um, you know, there, there's around on the internet. There's uh, memes um, for for RBF or resting bleep face. <laughs> I don't want to say the word because I think you guys know what I'm talking about, right? So, you know, and people laugh about, yeah, I have resting bleep face, right? If you have resting bleep face, then change that. You want your countenance to be pleasant. That makes you more open and approachable um, for, you know, certainly with your care, care team. Okay, so um, looks like I have a few more minutes here, so I'm going to kind of keep on going, uh, running through my marathon. So this slide shows, shows us some tips for families and patients for successful par partnering with their care teams. This was provided by the CF Foundation. So number one, ask for help with your family's care plan. Share openly and honestly about what your loved one's needs are so that your team can work with you. You are the expert in what works and what doesn't work in your family's lives. And you need to share that information. If something's not working, share that with your care team so you can come up with solutions and brainstorm together. Your team is there to support you. Share what's going on in your life. When life changes happen, your family's care, care plan may need to change. Life can sometimes get in the way of doing your da daily medical care and vice versa. Your team knows that things come up and that they know that these, you know, this complex medical regimen is, is going to affect how you're able to manage your disease. Share what's going on so your team can help you make positive changes. Communicate outside of clinic. Your family manages your life, you know, your, your disease every day. So why wait until clinic to ask questions? Um, CF care happens in real time. So think about how can you reach out to your care team with new ideas or question when something comes up. If something urgent is going on, contact, connect with your team quickly so that you can get your advice and get your questions answered. Um, and Heather will talk about this, um, but she she mentioned that with for her care center, um, she accepts emails. And so um, find out from your care team, you know, how you can communicate with them directly and quickly. Invite other people into your family's care planning. Managing a complex disease doesn't have to be a solo activity. Um, it's a family affair. So think about a team approach to care. Who else in your life can join the journey of managing um, rheumatoid arthritis, invite them to participate in discussions at your clinic. Parents, grandparents, a sibling, a trusted friend. This is especially important if you're a single parent. Reach out, support, involve other people. Bring them into your life, bring them into your world. This is especially important in case something happens to you. Make sure other people know what's going on so that your child can be well taken care of. Believe it or not, things do happen to parents as well. And we want to make sure our children um, have those people in their lives that know what's going on with their care. And then approach difficult conversations with respect. You and your team are motivated by a shared goal, improving your loved one's health. Your team is there to encourage you, to help you, but it's not always easy to work together. Sometimes we may have personality conflicts. Sometimes we don't necessarily like the person that we're working with, believe it or not. Um, but you know, we need to do our best to have those conversations, figure out ways to work together and to be respectful for the sake of our child's care. Here are some helpful tips that I came up with um, that I've used over the years to seeing your healthcare team as people just like you. When I started working with them one on one with um, some initiatives being on the parent advisory committee for our CF clinic, I started really seeing kind of behind the scenes behind that invisible veil um, that, you know, their families, they have families, too. 
they they have kids. Some of them have kids with chronic illnesses. Um, you know, so they're they're people just like us. Reach out to them. Um, get to know them and take responsibility for building the relationship. If they're not reaching the the, the divide to reach out to you, then it, it benefits us. Um, we need to take responsibility for reaching out and building the relationship. It's our child's life that's at stake. We have the most to gain and we have the most to lose. And for most of our health care providers, it's not just a job, but for us, and for some of it, maybe it is just a job, but for us, this is our child's life. This is their life that's at stake. And so it needs to be primarily our responsibility. I already mentioned this, suspend judgment, avoid defensiveness and personality clashes. Understand our own triggers. If you're having a personality clash with someone, dig into it. Maybe talk to your social worker, talk to a therapist to understand what is it about this person that's triggering you. Maybe they remind you of someone, you know, maybe it's going into your past. Maybe they remind you of a parent that you don't get along with. I mean, honestly, it's kind of funny because medical providers are kind of a parent figure. They're an authority figure and it can bring up issues for us. So, so understand what's going on. Brittany mentioned a lot of this. Um, these were great tips. Be prepared for clinic visits. Be on time. Take notes. Visibly write these notes down. Ask questions and request written resources. We cannot possibly remember everything in a clinic visit. We just, we get tapped out. We can't um, remember, you know, remember it all. Again, know the philosophy of the clinic so you know what to expect. Is it family-centered care? That way, if you have problems, you can call on those elements of those definitions. You know what your rights are. You know what the expectations are. And then, you know, know where to go for escalating a problem. If you've got a situation that you're struggling with, escalate it. Go up the ladder. Don't just stop at, at the provider. Um, just keep going up the ladder. So now I'm going to kind of end here with, I'm going to share a story with you about how our CF team partnered with us for a life impacting experience for my son. Um, he was a Boy Scout and becoming an Eagle Scout is considered a peak experience for scouting and going to Philmont Scout Ranch in the high desert of New Mexico is, is uh, an incredibly impactful and difficult experience for young men, but it's an amazing experience. Described as a premier high adventure camp, Philmont challenges scouts with more than 214 square miles of rugged northern New Mexico wilderness, taken right off their website. Rugged is right. No electricity, no water, no services. An 11-day trek with only what you can carry on your back. So you can only imagine my concern when my 15-year-old son with cystic fibrosis proudly comes home and announces, Mom, Mom, our troop is going to Philmont Ranch this summer. It's going to be so cool. We get to see dinosaur bones in an airplane wreck, and we get to pack our stuff on a mule, and we get to hike for 110 days. Wow. Now, it's moments like this, and they're more often than I care to admit, that I have to take a deep breath, I have to gulp, I have to swallow my inner helicopter parent. Um, Jake, wow, that sounds amazing. So, um, wow, I'm really excited about this, Jake. I really, gosh, it sounds really awesome. And have you thought about how you're going to do all your CF stuff on a trip like this? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is what we're dealing with, right? A trip like this, all of the care that has to go into it. And here's another moment that has happened more often than you might think where my son, who is a resourceful and responsible young man after he is a Boy Scout, uh, replies with the right answer. Well, mom, yes, I have thought about it. I have my portable nebulizer. I have ice packs for my medications and I can go every other day on my palmazine as long as I do my salt breathers daily, which don't need ice. Plus I can bring my acapella to do my breathing treatments and I'll be exercising a lot for airway clearance. Humph. Well, my son was obviously anticipating what I was going to say. He clearly had a plan for convincing mom that he needed to go on this trip. And I want him to go, but I'm torn. I'm afraid. He's healthy now, but what condition is he going to be in when he gets back? Is he going to lose lung function that we've worked so hard to maintain, never to recover it? Is, is, he gonna, is, it, is something going to happen to him along the way? But I also know without a doubt that this experience is critical for him. 
not only as a scout, not only as a young man, but also as a person with cystic fibrosis, we have raised our kids to see themselves first as a person and second as a person with cystic fibrosis, even while making CF care a priority in life. My husband and I have rarely said, no, you can't because of CF. Instead, we say, yes, you can. What's your plan? Write that one down. Yes, you can. What's your plan? What's your plan to maintain good health while you're having fun with sleepovers, with summer camp, with school trips? And of course now, yes, you can. What's your plan with Philmont Ranch? I also knew that Jake could handle this based on his track record of caring for himself while away at camp previously. I also knew that he has demonstrated his ability to take good care of himself at age 15 without my prompting, reminding, and nagging. This is important for those of you who are raising children and with young adults and, you know, that whole um, transition thing, which I can talk hours about, which I do <laughs> talk hours about, but not now. Anyway. And the other thing in this particular situation that gave me um, comfort was the fact that my husband, Carl, was looking into attending as well. As an assistant troop leader, he was invi invited to attend, and I knew that he would be there to help Jake, you know, manage um, his medications. So I said to Jake, all right, Jake, I'm impressed. You've thought this through. Let's talk with your team, with Dr. Gibson. Let's get their thoughts about this. Um, and then um, we will, uh, you know, we will go from there. So that is what we did. We uh, visited. This is a picture of our CF care team. We went to the clinic to plan for Philmont Ranch. Now, I knew that our team would be supportive. They're always very supportive for my kids. Um, and if anyone's going to be supportive, it's them. But I got to tell you, as a mom, there was a tiny part of me, my inner helicopter mom, that was hoping that they would just say, no, Jake, this isn't a good idea. But no, no, I guess Unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know. Actually, it turned out well. But, you know, luckily, they didn't say that. They said, Jake, you know, we think that's a great idea. Let's make it happen. And Dr. Gibson worked with Jacob to make a plan to make it work um, and uh, consent, you know, went through the whole process of what Jake needed to do to take good care of himself uh, with those harsh conditions on the trail. So Jake got his pre- uh, trip checkup and um, and they hit the road. So they we we worked hard to make it happen. The guys trained and the big day the big day arrived. Um, they took off on a bus and I cried as I tried to have a brave face and kept my my, my big girl pants on. Um, and uh, you know once they left, I, I cried and I took my daughter on a girls trip to Victoria, BC for for the time that they were gone. So 11 days, 11 days. These are some of the pictures of the, the beginning of their, their trek. This is a picture on the bottom right of some of the food that they ate. Um, not real healthy, but it, it worked. 11 days with no contact, no cell towers, no updates, no texts, no calls. And I had to let it go. I had to learn trust. I had to learn acceptance. And it was very, very hard. Um, not easy, but finally what seemed like forever, I got the call. The boys were back at base camp and now they had cell service. They had not showered in 11 days. Carl didn't even take a shower before he picked up the phone because he wanted to call me. They threw away the sleeping bags. They wanted to burn them, but uh, they were pretty disgusting. Uh, but the boys were doing well and I was finally able to react, uh, relax. Now, Jake was perfectly fine. There were no long-term negative health Im impacts. He lost a few pounds from the trail food and the hard work of hiking 110 miles. Um, he ran out of ice, so some of his medications went bad. The nebulizer batteries died, so, you know, he wasn't able to do his treatments. But you know what? It was okay. He was fine, and it all worked out. But most importantly, Jake had the trip of a lifetime with his father and the other boys who he bonded with in a way that will always be with him. He learned about himself. He learned about his own limitations. He himself said, I don't wanna go on this short hike. I need to go into my tent and take care of my breathing treatments. I was so proud of him when I heard that. He learned how far he could push himself. He learned when he needed to just kind of step back and take a break and just do some self-care and rest. 
He sat on a plateau with lightning all around him. He saw a view of the stars that few will ever see. And he got to see his dad take, char bleh, his dad take charge of a stubborn mule that no one else could budge. He encountered walls and he overcame them. He got to be a man. He got to be normal. He got to be free. He got to live. And this is the part of Jake that his self, that his, that his uh, medical care team doesn't get to see. But I'm so thankful that they understood it enough to help make that happen for him and for our family. Jake created memories of lifetime with his father, who less than two years later would pass away unexpectedly of a heart attack. Oddly enough, it wasn't Jake's health that was an issue at that time. It was my husband, Carl's. If only we had known. And yet somehow it makes that experience that Jake had at Philmont, Philmont Ranch with his father all the sweeter, even more precious and more meaningful. And it was in part due to the support of, his, of an amazing CF team and their partnership in making it happen and in a shared belief that life indeed is to be lived, that quality of life must be balanced with the burden of care. And I'm so grateful to my CF team at Seattle Children's Hospital. They recognize that my kids are more than just CF by help Jake, helping Jake manage his care without missing out on important moments. By helping me and my husband learn how to say yes, so that together we can help my kids have the experiences that shape their lives and have helped them both to become the amazing young people that they are today. And finally, for helping to tame that inner helicopter parent in me. I'm still working on that, even though my kids, now young adults, are 25 and 23. Um, but, you know, it's still there and it never ends. And my son is now at, um, at uh, University of California, San Francisco in medical school. My daughter's working full time at Bristol Myers Squibb in San Diego. Um, and she's got, uh, she earned her degree um, in biology at the University of Washington here in Washington. I'm very proud of them. Um, but I just want to remind you that life is not measured by the breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. And if I can tame my inner helicopter parent, you can too. So there we go. There it is. So thank you. Um, feel free to connect with me. Um, and it's now time for Q&A. Uh, and um, I did want to mention that we have updated just recently. We're still kind of working on the kinks, um, you know, all the little details, um, our book, Parenting Children with Health Issues. So thank you so much. And we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much, Lisa. I just have chills the entire time you were speaking. What an amazing story and heart wrenching. Try not to cry here as I listen to you talk, as I can sure many other families are feeling the same way. Um, I know even just getting my daughter Charlotte to go to arthritis camp was pretty exciting, and I was trying to um, tame the inner parent helicopter parent, as you said, the entire time, and. I let out all the tears in the parking lot after she got off the bus. So I'm sure that was only a few days. I'm sure I just can't even imagine how you had felt the whole time. And so much meaningful things to say. Um, I know we're, everybody's anxious for the, the Q&A. So I just wanted to quick um, the poll results if anyone else couldn't see them from earlier. Um, now I can see them. So that's exciting to see really where we are. We're all widespread here. And I want to open up for the Q&A if we have so many people in the chat who have been really talking about connection and wanting to connect with each other, being all over. And um, if you guys want, it's obviously up to your comfortableness. But if you want to turn off your mics um, or turn on your mics and chime in on the Q&A, I was looking at a few of the questions that came in and I'm just going to first off introduce two of our wonderful other healthcare providers that, that are here for the Q&A. 
because we don't want to forget them and their introductions as well. So Heather Ross we have here. She is a pediatric nurse at McMaster Children's Hospital. Um, she's been there for 16 years, which is amazing because you would never guess that. Um, and she works with the rheumatology team. We also have Victoria Molnar, who is a social worker at Glen Rose Rehabilitation Clinic. And Victoria, I kind of wanted to open up for you just to mention how you would access the social work. I know, for example, my daughter Charlotte, social work came to us, but I know many families don't even realize that social work is important to first go in about that, and then we can look at some of the Q&A and try more into the Q&A box at the bottom. So I'm hoping I'm not cutting out. Am I okay? It was cutting out a little bit over there. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah. So part of our team, and I guess it's different at every clinic, but part of our team, um, I typically see most of our new families um, in our new in our clinic and I will meet with them and I'll kind of assess what's going on for their families. Um, just kind of like what you were saying, Lisa, um, just kind of trying to figure out what's under the surface, kind of if there's some dynamics, if there's some needs, um, because we do follow until the child is 18 and kind of do that transition piece. Um, so we, we want to get to know the families and we want to know kind of what's going on and maybe where some of those, um, triggers are and where some of those issues will come up as far as medication coverage and things like that. So typically I meet with our new families that come to our clinic, um, and then as needed, um, you know, if something comes up, then the team will let me know when, um, when you know they'd like to be seen or if I notice um you know that there's something going on then I can also self-refer to go see them as well so it's quite collaborative and um and so most of the time when I meet with the families for the first time I just kind of introduce my role because it is very different in the community versus a social worker in a clinic um and so I'm very much there to support and um and we do recognize that um, the team is very focused on the child. And so a big part of my role is to focus on the family and how the family is doing. What does the family need to then better support their child? So, um, yeah, there's kind of many ways to get me involved um, or the social worker involved, um, part of that clinic. And, and that might be different for each clinic, but that's how that's how we do that at the Glen Rose. Thank you. I, I didn't you know another question that kind of that came in during the chat. Um, the social worker. There was a question. Sorry, that, there was a. Yeah. Yeah, it popped up. Um, one of the questions that is in the Q and A that I really want to touch on, especially with you talking about reaching out to the newly diagnosed families first, is receiving the diagnosis and starting on the journey is overwhelming. As a mother, I don't know what the questions to ask the doctors or team. Yet I feel as if I don't ask questions, I don't know what is happening. What can you, or how do we know what to ask? And do we know what? How do we get the information for the team? And when did we struck me when I saw it come in? Because that was me for so long, not knowing and just trying to ask as many questions as I possibly could. I feel bad for just because I constantly was asking her everything, which then she really, because we developed our relationship, like Lisa had said, um now she's used to it <laughs> um lisa did you want to touch on that one first maybe since i know you have many different medical professionals and we're asking all those questions yeah definitely um you know in the beginning it is hard because you don't know what you don't know 
Um, and I, I remember exactly that same feeling. In fact, I, I remember even saying that same thing, like, I don't know what I don't know. And when my kids were, especially Jacob, I mean, he's 25 now, there was no internet like we have now. So I really couldn't just Google, you know, <clears throat> um, and you have so many, many, many resources available to you now. I mean, for better or for worse, I mean, there's some danger in that as well, because there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but they sort of the, the short answer to the question really is, um, I think just knowing that you don't know is a really good first step and being open and wanting to learn um, is, is amazing. Um, and then the, the next thing is to reach out, reach out to other parents, connect with like Cassie and friends, um, reach out to your medical team, ask your medical team that exact question, you know, say, you know, I'm new at this. I'm, I'm concerned. I don't know what I don't know. What should I be asking you right now? One question that I used to use in clinic is I would I would say to the doctors, well, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? Like whenever there was a like a you know a decision that needed to be made, and they're kind of giving you know pros and cons, and I'd be like, well, you know, Doctor Gibson, if you were in my shoes right now, what would you do? And it just he would stop back and look at it from my perspective, and that really went a long way. And so I think you could you could use that with your medical team as well. You know, if you were me, newly diagnosed you know, and not knowing anything about this, what would you ask in my shoes? What should I know? What do I need to know right now? Um, and so I would definitely start there. And then again, of course, reach out to other parents um, and support groups. I, I'd love to add something too. Um, in terms of like a newly diagnosed patient, um, ask ask the nurse, ask the doctor for some handouts, ask them. I know we have at Mac, we have a, a QR code with tree links to different diagnoses that we see all the time. So, you know, ask them, do you have any resources that, you know, are more applicable for this type of diagnosis that will help help me instead of going down that, you know, Google rabbit hole and not having, you know, necessarily the proper resources. Yeah. And write questions down. If you're sitting at home and you're like 11 o'clock at night and you're like, oh my goodness, I have to ask Nurse Heather this. I, I, I want all of our patients to write their questions down. Email me, call me the next day, write it down. That's that I'm okay with that. It's a great piece of advice. And Heather, one of the questions that I was hoping to ask Nurse Heather, as you just worded it, which I love, yeah. um, was about medication. So someone came in and I know I can put my own personal experience in here for my yeah. daughter, but they asked what meds apart from the Trexate are there for a 10 year old with arthritis and lupus. Um, as a Cassie and friends staff, I obviously want to point you to the methotrexate webinar, which has a bunch of different medications included in it. Also with the JIA 101 webinar, there's many medications that come up in there. I know for my daughter, Charlotte, she was on methotrexate for years and switched to leflutamide and is now taking Remicade and Indomethacin and leflutamide still. So those are all different medications. There's so many out there, but if you wanted to touch on that one, Heather, that would be amazing. Yeah. Like, it's so hard to go over everyone, but yeah, there's, there's tons of different meds. There's NSAIDs, there's steroids, there's um, like Paquinil that they could try. There's um, MMF, there's uh, biologic uh, therapies like uh, rituximab that they could try. That would kind of be a conversation you would need to have uh, with the rheumatologist just to see what's best for um, that specific patient. Amazing. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else wanted to chime in on that. But when we're talking about medications, the next one that I have that I really want to highlight is something that I'm sure maybe even Brittany, if you guys have battled through insurance coverage and wanted to speak to insurance coverage battles, it's every parent's worst nightmare. Lisa, I can imagine in the state 
So that's a, a completely different ball game. Um, but this question says, any tips for securing, securing insurance cover for Simlandi? We are struggling with Sun Life as Simlandi is recommended for adult patients, but has been prescribed for our child. We have Sun Life ourselves with my husband's benefits and I've bet, battled with them many times not to go and bash different um, insurance companies, but really add that advocacy piece and connecting with your healthcare team. Brittany, did you guys ever have to battle with insurance companies? We didn't, we lucked out, um, but we almost thought we might have to when my daughter was um, first on her biologic, the Embril. Um, when she was first put on it, she she was actually under the age that it's recommended for, even though it was prescribed to her. Um, and so at that point, we spoke with the nursing team at our rheumatology clinic. And, um, you know, they mentioned, OK, well, let's see if it's covered. And if it's not, this is our plan. And I think asking that was important to us, too, because we knew we wanted it for her. We wanted, you know, her to hopefully start to feel better. And eventually she did. But um yeah, and then the plan at that time was even because of her age, they were going to ask for almost like a, a compassion uh, exception for it. Um, so I think for me, the biggest thing was just asking the team. And I think, you know, that's where social work in Victoria would get involved as well, um, just to, um, you know, ask those questions, because those are things I think we're very fortunate in Canada. Sometimes we don't have to go through compared to the states. Um, so for us, because it was kind of off label, for instance, my husband's medical coverage didn't cover it, um, but mine randomly did. So we kind of lucked out. Yeah, and I think that's the important piece is that you're communicating um, with the team about kind of the situation, because even sometimes I'll ask families, one of the questions is, are you paying anything out of pocket? It, it might not be the first time I've met with them, but, you know, in passing, I we just that that becomes a question we do ask because sometimes we change the doctor will change medication and the family doesn't say anything. They just assume, OK, it's not covered. So we need our child to take this. So we're just going to pay. And so sometimes if we don't know that, then we can't help. Um, but if we do know that, then there's ways of maybe changing what the medication is so that it does fit under the coverage. Um, maybe there's something that's um, a medication that's, um, you know, equivalent that, um, you know, the coverage will cover like brands and stuff like that. Um, sometimes there's um, an exemption that needs to be filled out. Sometimes we can get um, the parent support program to help kind of that compassionate piece. Um, sometimes the family will need to apply depending on the province, what um, there's different coverages that um, kind of like the Alberta um, child health benefits that we can like for lower income families. So we can look at different avenues, but we need to kind of know what's going on as well. So just continuing to have that communication. Um, if the family's not saying anything and we don't catch something, sometimes, you know, families are paying out of pocket. And um, so definitely we don't, we want to do our part to make sure that we help cover as much as we can. Yeah. And I think that's a really good lean way or leeway into this question here. So are there services, grants, or anything to help the children with extra financial obligations, like physiotherapists, psychologists, etc. I know, again, it varies province to province, but Lisa and Heather, if you guys want to talk about different things, or sorry, Victoria and Heather, I looked at Yeah, so I guess that it depends on what your clinic can offer, because um, so for our clinic, we do have PT, OT, we do have outpatient psychology, we do have social work. So um, there really is a multidisciplinary team um, that can provide most of your needs for your child. So there wouldn't 
necessarily be a need for private um, support. But if you're requiring that, we would look at, okay, well, does the parent have some sort of health benefit, um, health spending account, um, the employee support program for additional, let's say, psychology or physio. Um, and if none of that's available, um, you know, if the parent is on social assistance or something like that, we can look into what options are available for kind of um a sliding scale counseling, things like that, what's available in the community. And then at the end of the day, if and if none of that works out or you're over kind of the limit and now you're paying out of pocket, um, you would just be writing it off in your taxes. Um, so definitely, you know, lots of conversation to see what is available in the community, what's available to the parents. And it's just so individual. Um, that yeah, just requires a conversation and and digging into kind of what what fits for that situation. But most often, from my experience, our clinic team has been able to provide most of those um, resources and and equip um, the family. Um, the counseling piece is probably the one that that does come up um, because the family wants them to connect with a counselor regularly. So typically that is through kind of the parents um, employee support program or um, health spending, things like that. Thank you so much. I'm going to switch things up a little bit and jump in on a different type of question. What is a fever syndrome and what can we do for pain in the subcutaneous area for injections? Um, so I can kind of talk about that. So um, a fever syndrome is, is a disorder that's kind of classified by reoccurrent fevers. There's usually, um, depending on the type of fever that they have, there's um, specific or like they're more um, characteristics associated with that fever. So whether it's um, joint pain, rash, inflammation, um, we most of the time we'll ask the family, we have um, a handout that we give to the families and it's um, like a tracking um, device so that they can kind of track when the fevers are happening and any associated symptoms that they're having. Um, if they are getting injections of some sort, um, one thing that we do use for um, pain at the injection site would be something called Amatop, um, as well as Painies. Um, both are effective. The Amatop the, has to be kept on for 40 minutes, ideally, before you would inject at that site. Um, and then the Painies is more immediate, but doesn't work. Most kids say don't doesn't work as well. I was wondering if I can jump in with a question as it's related to what Heather was just talking about. Yeah. So we are six months into all of this with our toddler. She's like two and a half. Yeah. And I'm always, we give her her methotrexate every Friday evening. Yeah. And she knows she does not miss a beat this one. She yeah. is like, no, bum bum. Don't, I don't want to do it. Like she... And we try not to be, you know, not to have it as routine, but it's right. It's every Friday evening. Um, and I haven't used any of the creams yet. So we've just been literally trying to do it as quickly as possible and get it over with. Okay. Because um, I heard that using the creams, they just associate the smell of the cream or putting the cream on. And then they know like, I don't know, are we, is it the right um, way or the wrong way? I think every kid is so different. Um, the, what you're talking about, usually it's related to the alcohol swab that I've like experienced, oh, like they, right, yeah. the alcohol swab is what makes them have that vomit post methotrexate. Um, but if, if she's like anticipating it, I would probably go the painies route. Um, okay. you, you spray it on basically you in like literally just a uh you don't move it around while you're spraying it you spray it 
right in this, wherever you're going to inject, it'll go like, I call it the Elsa spray because it goes like a frozen, the skin and the um, hair on the skin kind of like freezes up like Elsa would. And oh, then okay. I, and then I wipe once with alcohol and then inject. Um, some kids so there's find, no wasting? No, there's no waiting. It's just instant. It's, oh, yeah, okay. you spray it. I, I say count to 10. You'll see once it kind of looks like that frozen and then inject and then it's done and over with. If she's having anticipate, like if she's getting pretty anxious for it, I always encourage parents to do something fun. Like, especially if they're at that, like at toddler age, Associ I want her to associate it with something fun after. So if she likes to have a dance party or yeah. if she, she gets a popsicle <laughs> so that she's not associating it as a negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll have to work on that one. Because... Even like um a sticker chart. I've sent that off to some of our Oh, yeah, uh, that's families. a good idea, actually. And so that every time they get, like, say they do two injections, every time they get a treat in my in my house that would be my role but um they get something so say they get a popsicle after they do their injection but when they get to the treasure box on the sticker chart then they get to go into a treasure box and pick like a, a cool new toy it doesn't have to be like a 20 dollar toy you can go to yeah like, <laughs> to dollar store and get something yeah. something but just so that they're associating it with something positive rather than um that that injection I know. yeah we might give the the painty the Can yeah try. see how we get on <laughs> thank Can you I mention something real quick too along with that you, yeah. you know and this is kind of where my parenting piece passion comes in so a few things like you want to make it fun like you want to like you know and you almost have to be silly like oh oh gosh it's time for the injection okay wow Elsa it's time for Elsa oh where do you want your frozen you know and like, like make it fun make it silly be joyful a lot of a lot of I mean kids pick up the parents attitude the parents vibes so the more lighthearted and fun and joyful that we can be and, and and it's not to say that we don't want to discount their anxiety, right? Because, I mean, we don't want to ignore that, but we can acknowledge it um, and still move forward. Like, I know this is hard. I know this, you know, I, I know that you have a hard time. I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, I know this is hard. I know sometimes you don't like this, but what would Elsa do? Doesn't Elsa like to be frozen? I mean, you can kind of just think about different ways that you can make it fun. And then again, you know, ha having rewards and encouragement, family fun time. Maybe she gets to pick out a fun thing to do that the whole family's going to do together um you know treats I mean at some point you want to back off on that because you know we don't want to be bribing teenagers you know I mean it, it becomes dangerous when you start moving into bribing you we want kids to do the right thing because it's the right thing for their body but at this young age you know certainly under five um you know making it fun making it lighthearted, and having that parent attitude being you know cheerful lighthearted and make it fun if yeah, I can I think add I'm, oh, sorry Victoria I think now that the fear of having to inject my own child has subsided as well but maybe we can work on making it a bit more fun <laughs> yeah yeah and I totally get that I mean as a parent it's hard for us but I mean I I had to I had to have good cries in the in the in the, my bathroom on my own so many times I, I just can't even tell you where I literally would have to just walk away, you know, hey, Carl, can you, you know, sit with Casey for a few minutes here? Cause I, I need to go to the bathroom. Like, you know, that's a great, that's a great out. And I would literally go in the bathroom and, and just have, just have a little cry and just have to breathe deep, get myself pulled together and say, Lisa, you've got to be brave and have a brave, strong face for your daughter or your son right now. Um, and so I absolutely acknowledge that it's hard. It's hard to see them suffer. It's hard to see them in pain. Um, it's hard to feel like we're the one inflicting it. Um, you know, um, and I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it is hard and, you know, they're going to learn resilience from us they're going to learn how to be strong. They're going to learn how to be brave. Um, and we can call them out. I mean, we can say Elsa's so brave. You're like Elsa. 
you know, I mean, we can, you know, especially with young kids, we can do that. We can call in their favorite characters. Um, and um, yeah, so hang in there. It's not easy. It's not an easy road, but you can do it. You can do it. I was just going to also add um, for our young kiddos, we find that with injections, the buzzy bee, I don't know if you've heard mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, um, good one. The one with like the I was going to talk about that, yeah, yeah, and that that's also a nice tool to use um, if you don't have that. Um, kind of just that distraction and um, just kind of numbs it, and it, it it's more playful than um, you know sometimes the the creams and you know the more medical tools. So maybe that would be a t um, something to try as well. Yeah, and Nicola, um, just to speak to it, similar situation with our daughter when she was about two. Um, she was getting her Embril and her Methotrexate same day, same time. She didn't want the yellow one. She knew it was anticipatory. Um, she, you know, we would dance, we'd put on songs, we'd do the whole shebang, she'd get treats. And, um, you know, she did get better for a bit. And then recently, now that she's, you know, she's four and a half, she's had more anxiety, I would say. And we recently received a Buzzy Bee, actually Cassie and friends supported us and they were able to uh, send us one, um, which was wonderful. And um, I think we're about the fifth injection in now with the Buzzy Bee and she's starting to realize, I don't feel the sensation. It doesn't hurt. Um, and so now I think we're finally starting to get somewhere. Um, so I really recommend the Buzzy Bee and I would reach out to Cassie and friends and see if they can support you in that as well. Um, I will definitely be looking to... into all of these <laughs> for sure. Um, I for tried sure. to time in my... Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I was just going to give okay. you an option. I saw you had your hand and I see CK has their hand up as well. Um, and then I do want to be cognizant of everybody's time and wrap things up afterwards, but we will have all of your other questions get answered afterwards. Um, I was just going to say for the, for my daughter, what helped with the anxiety about the shot for, for the Trixie when she was on it was um, I used to order these bandages, these special bandages from, um, from I believe it was Etsy we had gotten them from. And then um, we uh, we were following them on Instagram and she ended up doing a couple of videos for them. And, and they're no longer in business, but, but you, you can get like the different um, character bandages and stuff and different bandages on Etsy and stuff that they make. And she was, I, I, I had her pick pick what bandage she wanted because she insisted on having a bandage after her shot. So, I, so, so she would go through all her bandages, her whole collection there. And it was like a sticker collection for her, right? And then, and then, and then she would put it on and we call her her power patch. Then she'll, she'll put it on and she'd say, I am strong, I am brave, I can do this. And then she would have her shot and then she put on her Band-Aid then she was good to go. Nice. I love that so much. Um, I see Katie, I do want to get to your hand being put up and then I'll, I see there's more questions in the chat. Obviously this was a much needed conversation to have. So those questions will get answered, um, whether it's from one of us personally, but we will get those answered as well. So CK, if you want to do that, and then we will wrap things up for the next. Um, my first comment is bravo to all the parents. Uh, unlike most of you who are new to this, I'm in year 12. My daughter was diagnosed at 16 months. We went into remission for a short period and now we're back in it. And unlike a lot of you guys, my daughter has a lot of issues, including extreme skin sensitivities. So we not only have JIA, but we go through more extreme stuff on top of that. Um, none of the options that you guys were mentioning even remotely work for my daughter because of her skin condition. Can you talk to me about what Buzzy B is? We've gone through needle phobias. We've gone through everything. She just turned 12. And you were mentioning, Lisa, that you cry. I can't even do that. I'm a single mom. It's tough as nails, dude. Single mom, two kids with medical things. I hear you. Can someone send me some info on what Buzzy B is and if it'll work because none of the other stuff even touches her. I can definitely send you information on a Buzzy B and our injection support kits after this. I will connect with you as soon as we are off the call, but I'm 
I feel for you. It's so hard. And I know I see Brittany nodding. I see Lisa nodding. I That's what drives me at Cassie and Friends is being a parent and having all of this. It's, it's our lives so much more than um, anybody really realizes. So also hats off to you. Um, I see that there has been a lot of amazing links going on in the chat as well. So be sure to check those out. Um, I'm just going to quick share my screen on these last couple slides and I will let you guys go for the night and get as many of your questions shared as possible. So many of you have seen our Juvenile Arthritis Canada Facebook page and that JM Sangers girl that comments on every single thing. That's me. Um, so I let's keep the conversations going. Again, even if you, some of these questions when you were looking for these resources, if you're on the Facebook page, post in there tonight. Let's keep the conversation going off of Zoom after we tuck our kids into bed and carry on throughout the night. I do want to highlight some of our amazing upcoming events in just a couple weeks. I know there was some teen questions that we didn't get a chance to talk to. We have our webinar Beyond Transition, Advocating for Your Rheumatic Disease Needs in the Workplace on Tuesday, April 9th. Um, it's going to be an incredible session. And I think that's something that will be so helpful, even if you're not at that transition age my daughter is 11 and wanting to tune in it's going to be a great one um after that sunday may 5th ontario families especially but and it's this this is open to anyone in canada if you can make it there come out we have our juvenile arthritis family day conference on sunday may 5th at the kingbridge center in toronto um there is limited helping hands bursaries so please you are interested if you really think that those needs of conversations and community are there I really want to see as many people at family day um and then the runs and walks I know Brittany highlighted these in her slides that was where I started with my just me and my healthcare team walking in the middle of COVID um from a distance now we have all these walks all across Canada First one being in Halifax on May 2 for a weekend, May 18th, um, Calgary, May 26th, Okanagan, June 1st. Both Ottawa and Vancouver are hosting theirs on June 23rd, and there's many more across the country coming after June. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then keep in touch with us. Um, there's the website, which you've seen so many links shared for and how many amazing resources we have. You can always email any questions or more to info at cassieandfriends.ca and follow us on our social medias. I know if you're on Twitter, it's been live tweeted this entire night throughout all the different um, comments, Instagram and Facebook. We're always sharing as many resources as we can. So keep in touch. And to help us, to please consider making a donation. They really find so much meaningful work that I've been able to see over the years as a parent with Cassie and Friends and now behind the scenes as an employee as well. And I just want to thank everyone. You are all such busy families with so many things going on. So you made the time to come out tonight and that's so amazing. So thank you for coming and being here for our first virtual education of 2024. And thank you so much to our speakers, Lisa and Brittany and Heather and Victoria. It's so great for everybody to be here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. This was an amazing 